Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, May 20th, 2021. Baltimore County schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting, despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's Equity Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting decisions on an agenda item. Ms. Armstrong, if you would, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Yes, Ms. Scott. Present. Dr. Aaron Hager. Present. Ms. Pasteur. Cheryl Present. Pasteur. Present. Thank, thank you. Lisa Mack. Present. Thank you. Ms. Armstrong, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. Logan Washington. Present. Ms. Lagerman. Present. Mr. Handy. Present. Are there any other staff members on the call? Thank you, Ms. Armstrong. And I also wanted to make sure, are there any other board members who are joining us on this call? Okay, great. Okay, and now um, we will discuss, um, well, we will first look at the uh, new business and it looks like the first item of discussion is just is the system wide equity teams learning for equity and um, for that we will be hearing from Dr. Logan Washington, Ms. Weber, Ms. D. Donato, Ms. Adams, Dr. Roberts, Mr. Chira and Mr. Mustapir will present. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, during our 318 meeting, Ms. Pasteur and other board members asked a question about equity teams and school engagement. After that point, Ms. Lagerman and myself launched an ongoing survey, really looking at the active nature of school-based equity teams. Next slide, please. And so tonight I'm going to give a preliminary update on um, our school's reporting of having ac active equity teams. And then I will also um, ask three principals that have so graciously um, offered their time to talk about their equity journey. Next slide, please. So at 513, which was last Thursday, we had 79 schools reporting that they had had or had not had an equity team. So if you look at the graph, it states that 92% of the 79 schools reporting, and again, the survey is ongoing, um, have an active equity team with 8% saying that they don't have an ac active equity team. Next slide, please. So in an effort to really think about um, the role I know you all are thinking about in equity council and the ways that the council and the Board of Education Equity Committee can support schools. I've invited three principals to really talk through their equity journey. I have Michelle Webster from Featherbed Lane Elementary School. I have Natalie Adams from Dundalk Middle School. And Joe Gyra from Hereford High School. So I'm going to invite um, Michelle Webster to talk about her journey 
as an equity leader and where her team is in the process of understanding and actualizing policy 0100 in her building. Michelle, are you ready? I sure am. Thank you so Good much. Good evening, Madam Chair Scott, members of the board, BCPS colleagues, and community. I'm Michelle Webster, and I'm the proud principal of Featherbed Lane Elementary School. It's my honor to share with you tonight our equity journey at Featherbed Lane. On July 10th, 2019, the administrative team of Lori Grant, James Marthy, and myself became a team at Featherbed Lane. Prior to this date, there was not an administrative team operating at Featherbed Lane. I was the assistant principal brought over from Hillcrest Elementary in April to support Hill Featherbed Lane, and I was promoted to acting principal. Our team was in place for six months prior to the closing of schools due to COVID-19. Our focus was on every student having educational opportunities in a safe learning environment. One of our first goals was to establish a safe learning environment for all students and all staff. We had to create a space that afforded every student and teacher educational opportunities. This meant creating spaces that were acceptable for student learning and teaching spaces. We removed seven truckloads of broken, dirty, and outdated furniture to logistics just that summer alone. Lockers were painted, a new sign was installed, new gym floor, cafeteria, and main office floor were all installed. The stage was refinished, and all teachers received new donated chairs. Our safe, helpful, and kind commitments were implemented for students as a way of learning and growing in spaces at Featherbed Lane. And this included a vision and a school school-wide behavior plan. We established a care team with a social emotional learning focus in order to view each student and have a proactive approach to ensure student academic success. This care team consisted of two school counselors, an MTSS resource teacher, social worker, instructional support teacher, school nurse, psychologists, and administrators. The team met weekly to discuss students and supports, all with a proactive approach in mind. Title I funds were used to support the, the counselor and MTSS resource teacher. We used the compass and introduced this as a way for teachers and students to have courageous conversations and lead in spaces with one another. Next slide, please, Mr. Corns. We established a culture and community of learners by putting structures in place for an instructional leadership team and an equity team with a school focus of accountability. As these structures were put in place with our teams, value was placed on instruction, learning, and how students were learning in classrooms. Teachers were provided with supports and professional development. The school progress plan was a focus on standard-based learning and high expectations for all students. Teachers engaged in professional learning communities with one another through PLCs offered through Featherbed Lane and BCPS. The value shifted to can do and high achievement for all. Data meetings, grade level meetings, and structures were implemented to consistently evaluate what was working and engage in conversations to move students forward. Personalized instruction occurred for students prior to the closure and every decision was focused on what was best for students. Instructional practices using support through the residency in unpacking standards and revisited for success through walkthrough tools, informal observations and consistent feedback. The feedback proved to be a positive tool for teachers and students in establishing a positive culture. It was important for us to build the trust in conversations that we were having so that teachers understood that the administration was supportive to move instruction forward. 
Advanced academics courses were put in place for students, and now students are recommended for middle school advanced academics placement. This year alone, 44 students out of 44 percent of grade five students were recommended for at least one um, course in middle school. 17 percent for ELA, 20 percent for math, 35 for social studies, 39 percent for science. We are intentionally accelerating students and courses and, pro and proving, providing instruction for students in advanced courses and engaging in enrichment activities. In ELA, 52% of students earned an A or a B in advanced courses, 48% of students earned a C, and in math, 89% of students earned an A or a B, and 9% of students earned a C in advanced courses. Next slide, please, Mr. Corns. In our role as administrators, it was imperative that we worked on trust with our students, teachers, and community. We are responsive and visible. As we shifted during the closure, video messages, virtual meetings, visiting homes was a regular pattern of behavior. We had to find ways to connect with teachers and students and families. The administration maintained parent connections through phone calls. Many, many parents had our own personal cells, we use Talking Points apps, Google Meets, Friday food pickups, um, parent listen and learn series with our school counselor and biweekly connection meetings. We held outdoor in-person trainings and virtual registration meetings, virtual and in-person registration meetings. We provided supplies for all students throughout the year. We used a BCPS to deliver supplies to students in the community. And the importance was that all students had the same opportunity and received whatever support they needed. We used brainstorm meetings for all grade levels as a way to start the day utilizing conscious discipline and set the stage for the day for success. Our focus during the closure and in the return was to continue, continue to provide grace to students and families. We use the analogy that we are all in the same storm, just different boats. This helps staff to understand that we are not lowering expectations, but we are allowing for grace in the middle of a pandemic. A partnership provide, was provided with Always Reading, which is, which is an organization that allows for students to build classroom libraries. The books are diverse and the students can see themselves in the characters in the books. Next slide, please, Mr. Corns. We are continuing with professional development as teachers were offered a book cart to select personal development, professional development books to be able to join in conversations with others in book chats. We focused on a book study this year, being the change. Throughout this book study and professional development, as a staff, we shared identities, unpacked bias, developed an understanding of microaggressions, and discussed intent versus impact. We have much work to continue to do at Featherbed Lane, but we've had much repair to do as well. We are now in a space of trust. For example, teachers trust that the administration will do what they say. Teachers trust other staff members to show up for work. Since July of 2019, there has been repairing that needed to occur and a building of trust for all the staff. Students are held to high academic standards. As a school, Featherbed Lane is continuing to grow and learn as a school community. Families receive communication and feedback, and students are learning and growing. Our data is showing that. The academic achievement is continuing to increase with a focus on structures, supports, and intentional accountability. Thank you for your time and for allowing me to highlight the continued equity journey and student success at Featherbed Lane. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, another result of the survey that we launched, 50% um, of all schools report, just as Michelle said, that, that everyone's in the conversation together. They reported that their instructional leadership team also serves as their equity team. So schools are looking at an all-in leadership approach to equity, as well as what does it look like in classrooms with students each day. 
So without further ado, I want to actually introduce um, Natalie Adams from Dundalk Middle School to discuss her equity journey. Can you advance the slide, Mr. Quartz? Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, board members, fellow colleagues and leaders. I am again Natalie Adams, principal of Dundalk Middle School in my third year in this role. Next slide, please. I'll start by sharing our data story based upon uh, pre-ransomware, if you will, um, some of it in the, anyway. Um, our enrollment right now is at 835 students. Two thirds of those students are black and brown students. When we look at those areas of concern regarding our black and brown students, we monitored data related to attendance and absenteeism, suspension rates, academics, and overall survey results. And what we found overwhelmingly is that in those areas, they were highest amongst our black and brown students. We also found underrepresentation in course enrollment, um, specifically advanced courses, GT, Honor Society, and the Honor Roll. And those are places where we continue to monitor what's happening with our student representation. Where we did find consistent representation was with our AVID courses. And um, right now that percentage is at 57% black and brown students. So that's promising data. We are a school-wide um, AVID, AVID site of distinction. So therefore we know that those practices are beneficial to those students in that population. We need to expand the work. And that led to uh, what I will share on the next slide started. <coughs> We started by focusing on increasing our staff diversity wherever possible and when possible, and currently it's at 27.1%, um, providing cultural celebrations, student equity group, building signage in, in multiple languages and mentor groups that celebrate the diversity that exists. And the sign that you see pictured here is one from a, uh, one of our classroom teachers who really connects with students on all levels. And um, that's just one example of the type of relationship that we foster in Dundalk Middle. Next slide, please. How it's going. These are just examples of some of the things that have come out of those celebrations. Um, the group of gentlemen at the top re represent that student equity group that we started that was really from uh, the result of two groups of students disagreeing. Um, we found that there was very little representation when we were wanting to celebrate um, the cultures that existed in the building. And so the door decorating is just one another example of how we want to bring to light again the many faces and greatness that exist amongst all cultures that are represented. Next slide, please. So the approach that we took um, was to focus first and foremost on our instructional leadership team for training and then develop an action team to continue to support the ongoing work of um, the equity, the equity action that we want to uh, facilitate. So everyone on the leadership team participated in equity training. Um, we participated with in factuality with Principal Kafele, and then also looked at our own biases. And that led to a decision to have a no opt out approach using book studies and the six books chosen here were through the collaboration with the equity office to indicate uh, what do we want to do with our focus and, and conversations around equity? What areas do we want to try to target? And the three areas were mindset, information and teaching. And so the no opting out position that we've taken is that it's scheduled on our PD Mondays. And so to support that with funding, those book leaders uh, receive additional stipends for being able to plan this PD that's rooted in the work that we want to do to continue to peel back those layers and attack those biases um, with respect, with fidelity, with compassion, but um, unapologetically. The progress that we have made is that we continue to build trust and relational capacity with our group members. Uh, we have increased professional development engagement by working in these smaller groups as I indicated with the six books that we have here. 
The expectations to concentrate and focus on equity are included in our informal tools and are part of our common planning conversations. And we continue to operate in the protocols that have been provided by the equity office. Next slide, please. So when we look at as we approach the end of the year, what do we need to do going forward? We need to continue to build upon that trust that we're starting to establish, identify and call out those biases and any deficit thinking that may exist. Um, as we began to have conversations about acceleration versus remediation, this was a good space to also revisit um, our mindset and our biases around what kids are capable of and what we believe that they're capable of and how we present that to them. We plan to offer additional training for those staff members who are new to Dundalk Middle and did not have an opportunity to participate in prior training. And then we want to move from uh, being reflective to actionable steps, including um, assessing our current model, gathering additional input to see if we want to stick with this six book structure and then um, calendaring those sessions and making sure that they are maintained. This year has been filled with some pivots and some adjustments and so sometimes those sessions that we had planned were forced to be moved. But if we operate with intentionality and accountability, then we won't deviate from those prioritized sessions and we will move something else versus moving this work that's important. And that will allow us to develop an action plan that is going to be used for school wide instructional implementation. Next slide, please. Um, this is something that is a slide that I share with every uh, meeting, faculty meeting, leadership team meeting, department chair meeting. It is a reminder that we must be champions for children. I know that you've probably seen this before, but this is what we believe and we will walk as champions and do no harm to children. So I thank you for the opportunity to share a glimpse of my amazing school. Thank you, Ms. Adams. We really appreciate your perspective. Up next, I want to introduce Joe Gyra from Hereford High School. Good evening, or yeah, good evening, good afternoon, board members. Boy, those are tough acts to follow. Um, great job, ladies. Um, I wanted to thank you, board members, for the opportunity to present Hereford's equity story with you. I've been here for the last 14 years as an assistant principal and the, the last seven as a principal, and I've learned that uh, the community presents some truly interesting challenges. Frequently, I'm discovering uh, through the news media of events that have happened before I even get to school. Um, I want to talk to you just a second about my equity journey. Um, I started in Baltimore City Schools, came into Baltimore County, worked at Old Court Middle, um, Randallstown High School, uh, Western, um, Franklin, and been in a number of different schools. Uh, and all of them had a diverse population of students. Hereford is truly unique. Um, it, it has some interesting challenges. I feel that in the last few years, for a lot of reasons that I'll discuss, we've really worked hard to create a diverse team of teachers, our equity committee, to address these challenges and begin the work of solving some of the equity issues that exist. Um, Jim, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, with that in mind, I broke today's presentation down into four different phases. Uh, and this first phase presents some of the challenges that got us moving um, into the urgency with our work that needed to be done. Um, first and foremost, um, the majority of our students in the Hereford zone are white. The student body is white, the staff is white, the community is white. In addition, just geographically, it's extremely sheltered. 90% um, of the students in the school out of 1300 students are white, which leaves me with about 100 students who are black and brown. Um, that presents in itself an interesting challenge. Uh, one of the things that we discovered as an equity team when we really looked at the situation closely is that our black and brown students and our LGBTQ students um, who have to exist in this environment um, and work in this environment awful in order to assimilate into the population. They really take a chunk of who they are and their culture and they 
they lose that to be able to assimilate into a white culture. And we felt that that wasn't really beneficial to the kids. And as we worked with students, we discovered that even more so. Um, there is a higher teacher. There is a high teacher retention also. We have a very veteran salted staff whose mindsets are fixed. The urgency doesn't seem to exist to them um, to, to make a change. Um, in fact, they're resistant to it. Teachers historically have not therefore been responsive to issues occurring throughout the building and many racially charged issues occur outside of the building. They spill into the building through the community, uh, through social media sites such as Instagram and Snapshot. Those are the ones I'm referring to that I discover on my way into the building in the morning. Um, and then finally, Hereford High School student and parent groups propose state legislation to ban symbols in public schools. Part of our problem at Hereford is when a teacher, well, let, let me say it a different way. We've had situations where substitute teachers have come into the building and they don't even understand cultural relevance. Uh, we've had substitute teachers who will um, um, approach a, a black student, a female, and touch her hair and, and uh, make comment about it innocently. Uh, we've had um, parents come in wearing tar baby shirts into the main office um, without having any sense of the relevance of what they're doing. Um, and that's, that's tough because in the same, in the same breath, students frequently and you know I'll use those infamous confederate symbols that come in here on book bags and on on uh, on uh, book covers and flying the confederate flag on vehicles that come onto the parking lot um, teachers and um, staff when approaching students to try and tell them that that's not an appropriate symbol symbols of hate swastikas that they're not appropriate symbols frequently end up with parents um, and having conversations with parents because culturally uh, many parents in the community don't see that something as inappropriate. So frequently we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place because we're looking for some sort of policy while we're still trying to deal with the parent in the situation, but also being able to, to hinge this on an actual policy or a rule. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we did preliminarily is we began to look at action steps to work with this. And in 2015-17, the leadership team here at Hereford attended two years of foundational equity training with Dr. Durant and Dr. Lisa Williams at the Doubletree. That really got us in the right frame of mind and being able to actually begin to construct a path or a course of action. We selected leaders who attended the one year of the coaching for equity, and then our equity team formed and met um, and attended county-sponsored training and consisted of those members who were selected to attend uh, the training during those school years. Um, at the same time, in the schoolhouse, we, we saw that we needed to do some school-based professional development sessions that focused on informing teachers of the LGBTQ and topics. We have a large population of LGBTQ students here. Um, so we used one of our own, Sam Tillman, who was an art teacher at Hereford, but was also very concerned with the population of LGBTQ students and started to make presentations to the faculty uh, finding a way to bridge faculty with these students. Also Jabari Laos, an outside presenter, came in and did a couple presentations to the faculty. Um, at the same time, we had social workers and school counselors who began affinity group work. Um, what, two of them, one, uh, we had um, two years with black female students with a focus on identifying issues within our school. And we found out that uh, the black female students truly enjoyed this because it really gave them a form that allowed them to exchange some of the concerns and how to address some of the issues that were coming up in the schoolhouse. In addition, um, two years with black male students with a focus on creating a partnership. We we had James Bell, who was a former SRO at Newtown, uh, come in and coach and work with some of our black students. And again, the whole idea was to be able to give black students a form where they could convey some of their concerns. Next slide, please. That then got us to implement some action steps. 
So we formed PLC focused on school climate and social emotional learning and equity. Our LGBTQ students actually would be able to develop a voice and they requested the administration to implement some policy changes. For example, they wanted single color graduation gowns. They want us to create an all gender bathroom. And it was great because we were finally we were finally hearing voices uh, from these groups and giving them a form to communicate their concern. Um, student testimonials from the LGBTQ students were sought after and were presented small scale to the instructional leadership team. And then once vetted, we presented them to the faculty members. So again, concerns were now expressed to our 100 faculty. Um, I started to facilitate monthly lunch bunch sessions and met with affinity groups to gather what I thought was qualitative climate data. And so for an example, I met with AP students, I met with IEP 504 students, black and brown students. I met with students who were graduating and asked them what they thought we had done well, what we didn't do well. I brought ninth grade in graders in and ask them in these lunch bunch meetings what their expectations were. And I was able to convey some of this to the faculty. We set a couple ground rules and those ground rules were this was much like Vegas. What happens in this room stays in this room and it really became a true forum to really dig in and get some testimonial and some information about what was working and what wasn't um, from there. Um, we put together an equity team that was diverse, a social worker, a stat teacher, uh, an equity liaison, a principal assistant principal, and a couple teacher leaders. We collaborated within the feeder pattern schools. In other words, up at, in the Hereford zone, the elementary schools feed to one middle school, that one middle school feeds to the high school. So if there are problems in the elementary school, they're eventually going to manifest themselves at Hereford High School. And so we began to work with the principals and we began to put uh, equity teams together, PLCs that involved all of the principals and all of the equity teams throughout the Hereford zone. Um, we also began to do uh, book studies, White Fragility, my personal equity journey, which was an online program we looked at. And we also looked at some of the equity sessions sponsored by Office of Equity and Organizational Development, now with a focus because we had some clear goals in mind. If you take a look at phase three, next slide, we implemented the following year some of those policies. Jim, can we go to the next slide, please? Yep, thanks. Um, the installation of an all gender student bathroom. Graduation gowns were a single color. Uh, we continued the monthly uh, principal lunch bunch sessions. In fact, they became quite popular and I'm sure it wasn't the cookies that I was presenting to them. They actually felt that this was an opportunity to be able to express concerns um, and they trusted. There was trust that was built finally in all of this. I would invite different teachers to come in. Um, I would make sure it was OK with the group that we selected and these groups stayed small, perhaps 20 at the most. Um, we expanded the equity team, um, the equity steering committee, the steering committee, eight members who reviewed professional development plans and leads and, and led small group sessions. We discovered that the best way to conquer some of the cultural biases were to work in small groups that were put together strategically so that teachers who were resistant to change had an opportunity to express themselves, but then other members in those small groups were able to engage in conversations. Um, instructional leadership team worked to create equity teams. We, we put eight of them together uh, and there was a more explicit focus on the analysis then of student data, because again, if you don't have a sound environment where students are comfortable of all students, then instruction suffers. And so we began to measure our, our student data, uh, looking at the demographics, look at academic performance by subgroups, looking at the AP population, seeing where the inequities were, looking at discipline, farms, homeless, special education students, who were in those classes and was in fact that the right placement. Um, I shared my personal equity journey with the staff and talked about working in Baltimore City Schools and moving to Baltimore County. 
and the things that I learned to get to uh, uh, Hereford High School to be an effective leader. Um, we personalized it, I personalized it. Um, we took the fear away from teachers and we took a lot of their perceived notions away. Um, we continued to do small group sessions and what we did was we grounded them in site-based scenarios uh, with the goal of really increasing staff awareness of racial equity and utilizing the CCAR compass agreements, conditions for engaging in difficult conversations. For example, one of the things that I learned in one of the principal's uh, lunch bunch meetings was that black students and brown students were upset by the fact that an incident would occur in the hall and um, perhaps a racial slur or from another student or something of that nature or a teacher seeing that there was a Confederate flag on a, on a book cover and what well, I was told in those meetings that the teacher would turn the other way and walk around and it upset those students that the teacher wouldn't engage. And what we learned in these small meetings is that the teachers really didn't have the tools to be able to engage. So that was part of our challenge and that became part of our PD to be able to give the teachers the tools so they can begin to to approach. And again, we kept it personal so that it was real situations occurring in Hereford High School. Um, we were able to engage over the summer, that summer, um, that factuality game. We had a number of Hereford High School teachers, I was quite proud of the number, who participated in the game, but more involved, but more importantly, contributed greatly in the debrief conversations. Um, and strategically, we invited members of the community um, PTSA members in particular also to try and branch out beyond what was happening in the schoolhouse and try and get the community involved. Um, and we also invited a number of the feeder patterns in. Um, I, I think that afternoon we I caught very successful in terms of eye opening and beginning to strategically make some changes. And I think that's the key. Changes have to occur um, carefully and step by step, just small, small steps. Um, moving forward, Jim, phase four, the next slide. Um, we have found that one of the best ways to engage teachers in looking at equity and um, cultural bias is by engaging them in book studies. Uh, we've planned them in past summers. We'll continue this summer. Um, we're actually now asking department chairs in science, math, social studies, uh, English to actually select after talking to their teachers what a good equity book would be. Um, we set up a criteria and and um, so now uh, we're getting um, input from teachers. Uh, they bought into it and they feel like they're a part of, of what's taking place. Our goal, of course, is to assist teachers in creating an equitable clim uh, classroom climate and our professional development focus moving forward will be how do these tools help to identify and dismantle white supremacy culture in our school. Um, I'm always looking for support from the board. Good opportunity to be able to say this, um, to, to support our work uh, so that it's just no longer school-based. I'd really like something, and I know it's under review, but something that would specifically discuss the hate symbols, um, which would give me some teeth to, to lock into when I have to go beyond the student in the building and confront the parent. Um, it still is an instructional teaching learning tool, but it would be nice to know that that's behind my back as I go up against some of the parents and some of the teachers do. Um, we're gonna revisit and implement core activities that help move equity work forward. We're looking at the continuation of monthly principal lunch bunches. We're looking to continue site-based scenarios. We're looking at affinity groups and focused small group conversations. Um, we're in a good place. I'm so glad that we're coming back into the schoolhouse because this work does not work well in a virtual environment. It truly doesn't. When we're aware of something that happens on Instagram or we're aware of something that happens on social media, it's much better to be able to attack that 
head on in the schoolhouse with those players involved rather than have to do it virtually. So for a lot of reasons, but that one in particular, we're excited to get back into the, the schoolhouse. And then finally, uh, the last slide, as we prepare our equity work for the upcoming school year, um, this is a quote that my uh, librarian, uh, I'm sorry, let me try media specialist, sorry, um, uh, came up with. Uh, she is a member of the team. Um, she's been at Franklin and Carver and a number of other, other schools, and I think it's so important. Let me just digress for a second. My administrative team uh, is excellent, and I said the last four years because I do feel we have the right team together. You heard my background, but I have an assistant principal who comes from Chesapeake. I have another assistant principal who spent a lot of time at Franklin, and I have a third one who spent time at Newtown and Overly. So we come with that diverse background, and we understand where the school can go. So this is an appropriate quote, and um, this is something that we're going to try and focus in as we move forward. We are essentially sending students into the world who are ill prepared to deal with the reality of the challenges that exist. They will continue to unknowingly uphold a system of white supremacy because they cannot see themselves within it and contributing to that system, let alone feeling equipped to dismantle it. Um, we do our students no justice if they move into the world, college, business, not having learned what diversity is all about and the issues of equity. I'm sure I probably went over my time because that's what I do. I apologize, um, but thank you so much for allowing me to present this afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Ms. Webster. Thank you, Ms. Adams and Mr. Jaira. Are there any questions? Wow, this is Miss Scott. That was amazing. Thank you, principals. <laughs> wow, I've learned so much. Um, and actually, I, I can start off because I do. I'm sure we all, um, uh, as members, do have questions or comments. Um, one, you put up that 79 schools, or was it 79% of schools have an active equity team? And you said 8% do not have equity teams. I just wanted to remember um, correctly. And there were there's there's 79 um, schools reporting thus far because it's a, an open um, survey until the end of the school year just to give principals and other leaders time to answer that question as well as other ones. But yes, as of the 13th, which was last Thursday, 79 schools report that they have an active equity team. Well, 79 schools reporting 92 percent of those schools report to have an active equity team. Got it. OK, and so what I wanted to know is are um, equity teams a requirement at schools or is it a volunteer type of thing at each school and is it decided by the principal or who decides? Um, principals and school based leaders um, drive the equity work in, in their buildings. They get their support training and development, as you heard all three um, from our feeder pattern PLCs where they work together to really yeah. um, take the work from theory to, to practice, but it is absolutely a recommendation and has been one from our office for the last three years. OK, so it's a recommendation, not a requirement, and then it's up to each principal whether or not they want to have an equity team and get the support from your office. Absolutely, um, and each school has an equity liaison. That was my next question. Do all schools have equity liaisons? Yes. OK, um, and then um, how can we come up with or help encourage more schools to have equity teams or to develop them? What sort of supports or what sort of ways can we um, help them? Like you said, and you encourage them. So I guess maybe then how are you encouraging them or maybe do they need more supports so that we can have 100% um, schools having equity teams? Absolutely, great question. Um, our office offers our seminal developmental opportunity that it's open um, at least minimally with two offerings per month so that schools and leaders and teachers system wide can get the foundational support for them to move on. But also we have um, high performing equity teams frameworks where we have theory to practice sessions where teams come and actually listen to other teams that have are in the work and that are developing themselves as equity teams to move the, the work forward in their building. So we offer support training and development on team on developing a team and we have a framework around developing an equity mm -hmm. team in your building. OK, um, and then I'm um, hearing from uh, Mr. Jira 
which I thank you so much, sir, for your um, honesty and, and um, your presentation about your school and your background and everything. That was very informative. I wanted to know, has there been additional equity support for, um, he said it was Hereford High School, um, considering it seems like there's, um, he may be dealing with things that other schools are not dealing with, so may need additional support from the equity office. Is that provided to him? Yeah, I feel extremely comfortable that that is happening. Um, and can I just make a comment about one of your questions, um, Dr. Scott, before? Um, I think a lot of the equity work in the schools, I mean, I think it's great that the Office of Equity supports us and they do, but I'm telling you where the work really hits the pavement is when principals talk in meetings before the meetings actually begin uh, and get together. And I talk to a principal or, you know, I see Natalie Adams at a principal's meeting. I say, Natalie, you know, what are you doing to increase student performance? And it always comes down to creating an environment that's conducive to that, and that always comes down to the equity issue. And those informal conversations are, are priceless in terms of, the, at least I feel, are priceless mm -hmm. in terms of, of getting that work done. Natalie um, and, um, you know, Natalie and Heather, just in terms of watching their presentation, gave me some great ideas. If I need to find a way to implement them and I don't have the resources, that's when I go to the equity office for assistance. Great. Wonderful. Um, and lastly, because I know I've been uh, talking a lot, I'm actually also, and this does this concern Mr. Uh, Jira, is I'm also on the PRC committee and we did, um, we had policy 0100 where um, line 31D, it said, you know, about the board prohibiting the use of language and or displays of images and symbols which promote hate. And those include the swastika, the Confederate flag and a noose. And so this policy came out of committee of PRC, but, but I will let you know, not all members voted for it. It was said, that because it didn't pass in the um, legislature, then that, you know, wasn't, I guess, um, something that we should take up in PRC. Um, and I recognize now, and I'm glad you were able to connect the dots for board members because I don't know, and um, I believe Dr. Logan Washington was there, um, if this policy passed out of the actual board itself because I believe it did come before the board and if you could check on that for me um Dr. Logan Washington because I don't know if it came sure. before the board but I believe it did and I don't know that it passed out and so it's really good to hear you say that you know this could have helped you give some teeth behind it but unfortunately um because of the nature of board meetings and a lot of our policies are not being passed because um, the board is doing the full work of the committee, almost of all committees, in the full assembly. Um, and you are actually showing the impact of what that has for teachers, for schools, and how that can hamstring and, um, and, and, and be additional burdensome. And it's a way that the board can help. So, um, you know, uh, I, 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 we're going to continue uh, uh, working on it, and our goal is to support you. But um, your honesty and your candor, and that's why I wanted to be um, direct and straight with you to let you know that, you know, we are working to support you. But unfortunately, um, because of how our board meetings are, um, this was not something that um, you would be able to use um, to support you. So and, and I do, um, I want you to know that we are we are going to work, work on it. So thank you I, so much. I, I truly appreciate that response. And let me just be clear, it doesn't mean that we still don't do the instructional piece with the student. That's essential. But sometimes you just need to know that there's a policy behind your back that you can cling to and use when you get some of the, I'm going to use the word more stubborn parents who are kind of lockstep in the culture that they're in. But thank and that's you what so the role much. of the board is for policy and governance. And that's our role, and that's something that we have to improve upon um, because you're doing your role and we need to do our role. So I just wanted to basically let you know that. So yes, and um, I'll take other questions, Dr. Logan Washington, while while you're um, double checking on that. Um, let's see, it looks like, um, and I wanna go in order to make sure. And it looks like our first question comment is from Dr. Hager. Yes, 
Thank you so much for those presentations and thank you Dr. Logan Washington for bringing such wonderful speakers to us today who represent different levels of school and, and it was really wonderful to hear all the great things that are happening. Um, and I know I say this every meeting, but my, my background is in school wellness, which has some similarities as far as the structure of teams and, and kind of um, you know, the structure of things moving forward. And so the fact that we have three principals here who are fully bought in to, to this concept and are on board and are doing the work with their teams is so wonderful. Um, but kind of back to Ms. Scott's policy comment, um, I do wonder if we need a policy around having these teams in place because not every principal, it's not the top priority of every single principal, it's not the top priority of every single school. And so I want to know what your thoughts would be about kind of mandating the formation of these teams at the school level. Um, again, hoping that we can get those schools where, where it isn't, you know, at, the, at that moment in time, their top priority, just making sure it continues to stay in place. Absolutely. So the schools out of the 79 um, schools that have reported thus far, I'm sure we'll get to 100% prior to the closure of school um, this spring, 50% of them said that their school-based equity teams are also their instructional leadership team. What we do um, to, I think, Mr. to Joe's point, to, to Principal Jairus' point, um, it's those small group conversations. We have organized our principals in feeder pattern PLCs. So they are talking about communities, children, and challenges in a congruent way that actually shift the paradigms of what our children are experiencing in school as well as out in the community. So those PLC experiences that are principal led most of the time, but a collaborative effort then go back to the schoolhouse and drive some of the things that school teams are doing. And it looks like thus far, because again, that data is still ongoing. It What it appears is if is principals are taking that back and sinking it right into their instructional leadership teams is re and really that is where the work happens those core leaders at the school level drive the, the climate and culture of the school so i think you know we're, we're on to a good um on a good track with that particularly in our plc models as well as the ways that leaders are looking at instructional leadership teams to then drive the, the climate culture and outcomes that we see in our school. So I, I do believe the recommendation could be something that is sunk deeply, very deeply into the role of the equity liaison. So would the, if, if there were to be policy language around creating teams, it sounds like you think it should be a subcommittee of the instructional leadership team, is that correct? If not embedded, if not embedded. the ILT being the equity team. Because again, a lot of those um, core leadership beliefs actions and outcomes come from that instructional leadership team. Okay. And what principles, what are your thoughts on, on putting that into policy? Are they still there? there uh, yes, I'll start. Um, I think that you would probably um, get the very support that you would be seeking because just based upon the data that Dr. Logan Washington shared, that 92% is reflective of a good number of leaders who are already embracing this mindset. Um, but to provide the time, um, I don't know if funding is, is necessary, but if so, sure, we'll take it. Um, and the opportunity to continue that work, I think you'll see that um, you'll get the fruits of your labor because we're already invested without any of those requirements because we believe in the work. I agree 100% with Natalie Adams, and I think you will find that view shared by all principals. Um, absolutely. Great, and I'll just finish by saying um, one recommendation that we make in my work is that sometimes when there is a moment in time where adaptation of a practice is really, really high. It's the best time to adapt a policy. And so, because everybody's already doing it and so there's less reluctance, you know? And so it makes me wonder if 92% is the number we have now, let's just create a, create, you know, in, incorporate into our policies so that, you know, in 10 years, if it sadly becomes less of a focus, we know we'll say it's still in policy. So anyway, that's my own two cents, so thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Hager. And just to piggyback off of that, is that something then that would be added into policy 0100 or um, would that be like a separate policy? I guess Dr. Logan Washington, would you? Um, from my perspective, I do believe that it is probably not an essential article, but a necessary um, added 
article to policy 0100 because it also provides that um, cross referencing to our state policy educational equity policy also it doesn't stipulate that there's a team but there that gives us some of the um the accountability metrics and that the ways that we measure continuous growth of our students our schools and our communities i think it's a great um, addition from my perspective okay thank you um next it looks like it is Ms. Cheryl Pastor. Okay, good afternoon. And I want to thank the three principals for your presentations and where they were similar in some regards. There were some very specific differences that were relating or related to your particular schools. And I think that's important for us as we look at um, how we embrace the policy and what we put in it to offer support to our principals. Uh, let me just, uh, Ms. Scott uh, made um, the comment about one of the members of PRC who didn't vote because uh, the legislature didn't. And I want to make it clear that it wasn't as the chair of the Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee that they did not pass the, a bill because they didn't believe that it needed to happen. The conversation came out of the feeling that just as your schools are different, our counties are different, our school systems are different, and where there were some common symbols and language, there are some other things, as Mr. Jaira pointed out, there are some things that he found in the Hereford zone that uh, they would not find necessarily um, at feather bed. And Ms. Adams would find some things that were different from theirs. So it is incumbent on our school system, on our board, to make sure that we're hearing you as we did today and create a policy that covers the myriad of things that um, will we'll speak to the variety of populations and the variety of communities in Baltimore County. So I thank the three of you. I think that your differences certainly highlight that. And so that was important. So I thank you, uh, Dr. Logan Washington for selecting these three. The other piece is the reason I asked, I was one of the folks who asked her to take a look at the numbers in the schools is because we attended a conference and interestingly enough, the school that I we we heard often in terms of equity was Hereford, um, but there were other people who indicated that they either didn't know whether there was a group in in the school or they thought there was not. Which means we do, as a board, as a system, have to um, height heighten how we talk about this so that every person knows whether there is a, a committee or a group, et cetera, in his or her school. That's important. So again, I thank you because you point out those things. And as Ms. Scott says, as our uh, members often say, we're looking at equity in a holistic way. So it means not just um, looking at what we do instructionally, because it should be embedded in the instruction, but also as they do at Hereford, how do you work with your, or as he, Mr. Jara explained, how do you work with your teachers? And, I, and I, I think I heard that in all three of you. How are you working with your teachers? How are you working with your parents? Because we all come to the table with our biases. So I am hopeful that um, Ms. Scott, as equity uh, chair and PRC chair, that we are able to craft our policy so that we are speaking to all of those possibilities. But again, I, I, I want everyone to understand that's particularly anybody who thought we should not have a policy um, and we didn't vote on it, um, that the only reason the state didn't was because they want all school systems to do what we're doing now to have these kinds of conversations and craft that policy 
to fit our needs. But again, thank you, all three of you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Uh, next, looks like we have a comment from or question from Ms. Mack. Yes, um, I just kind of want to mirror what um, both what Dr. Hager and Dr. Um, Ms. Pasteur said. I always think of two quotes that say, you can't fix what you don't acknowledge and you don't know where you're going if you don't acknowledge where you've been. And what I heard from the principals who spoke today is like the answer to that, um, acknowledging the challenges, acknowledging the successes. And I really appreciate hearing those various viewpoints. Um, I have a question. I have been hearing from teachers who have been engaging just recently in the implicit bias training. And Dr. Logan Washington, is that something that's happening because they're using um, the asynchronous Wednesdays to do that kind of thing? Or is that an actual requirement in our schools? I know our office does not directly offer an implicit bias training. So it probably is something that, again, equity is is the work of our entire school system. So I would have to get more information on the offering to be able to render you um, an authentic response. But I know I can speak wholeheartedly for the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency, and that's not an offering that we have this year. So if principals are offering it, they're actually do, doing the work to um, have, I guess, teachers take the implicit bias test and then have the discussion afterwards. It's not a package that we send out. Is that what, that what you just said? Um, no, it's not something that that I know of is required. And, and no, it is not a direct mandate of anything that comes out of the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. It could be something that is a part of a school-based professional learning opportunity, but the um, implicit association test is a publicly held um, test that right. anyone can take at any time, and there are various types of IAT assessments that one right. can take and come back for a discussion. So it is a very widely held um, tool, and it's a it's norm referenced on about a million people um, to provide just perspective and information. So I am consciously aware that that could be that's something that could be happening, but it's not something that is mandated and or required by the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. So I've heard from teachers from three schools who are in the same, I, you call them something different, but I always think about them as feeder patterns. Zones. Zones. Well, not so uh -huh. much zones, but the, um, so perhaps it's something where the principals got together and decided because I've heard of it um, happening in three different schools um, and I think it's great, but I just didn't know if something had come out to say to principals you know, this is training or this is a discussion or something that we would like you to undertake. Absolutely. So what I will say, again, not having all, you know, the information that that you have, what I will say is Policy 0100 has an article that talks about implicit bias. So I think it probably is an effort to begin to actualize the promise of 0100, if anything. And again, that's my best professional juxtaposition around um a best effort or professional learning opportunity is to actualize the promises of 0100 under the articles that discuss implicit bias. Thank you very much and thank you principals. Uh, that was fascinating and very, very um, insightful. Great, thank you, Ms. Matt. Yeah, and I echo everything everyone said. That was that was really wonderful. So um, yeah, so um, is that the end of the um, first part, I guess, of our yes. presentation? Thank um, you. Ms. Scott, do um, I have the permission to dismiss our wonderful principals? They've given us some time this evening. Is that OK? Oh, absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you so much, everybody. Great Thank work. You. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes. Thank you for coming. OK. So next is a review of policy 0100, MAVE and BCPS questions. So during our April meeting, um, it was recommended that we take a look at the equity lens questions that MABE utilizes and the ones that we utilize in Baltimore County Public School as a decision making model tool and to look at those questions and go through policy 0100 as it's written today. OK, did you have any suggestions or did anyone have any? Come on, Mr. Corn, you go to the next slide, please. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. No, the policy is here. Um, it is it is hyperlinked um 
for those who I know you all have it before the, the public's use in the presentation. And could you go to the next slide? And what I did right here is just to look at a side by side perspective of the two decision making models. The one that we use in Baltimore County Public Schools, which is a tool that we teach principals and all of our staff members to look at when they're making equity based decisions. But then there's also one that um, may provides for the use of decision making with school board. So I wanted to make sure that you you all had both and had an opportunity to kind of take a look at them. Um, as you review policy 0100, because I know it is something that you all might want to consider um, as kind of like a bench card or something that is readily accessible for the committee as well as board members when making decisions during meetings. And if you could point out what were any differences that you noticed? Just so uh, the, the largest um, difference between what we use school based is the conversation around um, who's impacted. So the MAPE equity lens questions highlight underrepresented groups affected by this policy program, practice or decision. We consider those things, but we really want to know who. If you were to look at a policy, who remains um, what student groups, what communities remain underserved or left out of a conversation? So I think it's not a lot of variability, but it's just the ways in which and what we're looking at. So these questions that MAVE is designed look at policy and um, program practice and decision making with school boards, but ours looks at curriculum and, and different things that are on the operation side. So I wanted to make sure that you all had both um, variations of those questions to see if it is something that you all want to consider using as you proceed in your decision making models um, as you think of our we think of our way forward. Okay, great. Looks like we have a comment or question from Ms. Matt. Yes, um, during our last board meeting one of the speakers spoke about um, our two E students, twice exceptional students. And um, and I, I believe and I can go back to my notes, but the gist of what the speaker was saying is that she felt that two E students were left out of the discussion quite a bit and that the unique needs with um, with which they present are often ignored by BCPS. Um, would you consider them? I, I'm looking at the MABE slide. Uh, the third bullet, how you intentionally involve stakeholders who are members of the communities affected by this policy. <clears throat> Would you consider them um, as a, a group that uh, for whom we would have to apply the equity lens? I think we apply the equity lens to all of our decision making models. And when we think about our student groups that we serve in Baltimore County Public Schools, our twice exceptional students or our two E students um, actually fall under special education when we think about student groups. So it's the ways that um, policy 0100 has them spelled out. Now, when you think about our different st student groups, individuals sit in each and every one of those student groups. So when you think about students that receive special education services, our students that are two E students fall in that particular category. So absolutely, our policy as well as um, item number three in Mabe's equity lens questions apply to our two E students. And how as about our GT students? Um, you know, one of our, one of the statements in policy 0100 is to close achievement gaps. And my entire two and a half years on the board. That has been something that I have been focused on, but I attend a lot of the GTCAC meetings and <clears throat> there is some concern that we are not meeting the specific needs of our GT students. So they would also be a group of students for whom, you know, we, we would want to ensure equity. Am I correct in my thinking? Absolutely, we know um, that the quality of service gap or the achievement gap, which the literature talks about in within education we talk about is present in the highest as well as the lowest achievement bars. So we have to consistently look at the performance of our students within their student groups um, at all 
what at all levels. Like you talked about, your your two two E students are students that receive special education services and gifted and talented advanced academic services. They are all our services, which make that a student group also. And again, policy zero one hundred is written in such a way that all students are seen. Okay, but but the irony is. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to come to terms with if. No, I can't even facilitate the question. Thank you anyway, but thank you for that explanation. Absolutely. OK, um, were there any other questions or comments? Because I would just say that this um, our policy 0100 as it was um, rewritten and redrafted, I feel does connect with um, the things that the equity lens questions but on, on both sides. That's just from my looking at it, um, but I think that it can um, it is made stronger with um, item D about the um, prohibiting the use of hate language and hate symbols. Um, and then also I think adding um, like uh, Dr. Hager had said a policy in regards to having equity councils at um, or committees or, or whatever um, we'll name them at, at each of the schools. I think that will that will strengthen it. Um, so I, it, it, that also brings me to another, but I, I, may, I might be skipping a little bit ahead, um, but using this, would this be what we would use then to review um, other policies that we want to make sure are equitable? Absolutely. So can okay. we think about the utility of each of the policy, each, each and every policy, there are people that sit behind the policy. So when you all are thinking about implementing a policy, augmenting a policy, or creating new policy are individual student groups that are identified in 0100, which is everybody, um, have to be considered. And I think it is, to Ms. Mack's point, kind of spelling out what those student groups could be, um, just to get you know our brains thinking about every child every day. Okay, looks like there's a comment from Dr. Hager. Yes, um, so I feel like the two things we've talked about the most over the past few months um, with respect to kind of actionable things we can do would be um, developing some form of a school based team, but also a system level coalition of some sort. Um, and I wonder if that number three with the stakeholders, um, you know, if, if that's the direction we could or should go in to um, to help inform the policy. Um, Again, back to my, my sorry, I always bring up wellness because that's my world and that's where I, where I live a lot of the time. But that's, you know, the intention of a wellness policy is that it's informed by your local school health council. And so, um, you know, if there is some sort of a, a coalition with membership from the different schools and students. Um, moreover, if we talk about student led teams, um, I think that could certainly be part of the school level initiative that's outlined in policy, um, whether that it's united or separate, that could potentially be a school level decision. So. Thank you for that. Um, actually, and um, uh, Dr. Hager and um, Dr. Logan Washington, that actually leads us into our next thing, like um, revisiting the next um, BOE Equity Council. Yep. Can you advance the slide, Mr. Korns? Thank you. All right, so I know we talked um, in our March meeting about um, the BOE Equity Advisory Council, um, and we kind of put some preliminary perspective around it, but I wanted to definitely revisit what it was and have you all just to begin to think about what it is in purpose and intention. And we heard that's why I really wanted the principals to share your, the perspective, because whatever we create, we, you know, want to make sure we understand the school perspective and the ways that policy and counsel and support is a lived idea. But I just was really wanting to come back to revisit um, the purpose to make sure you all were comfortable with the purpose or some other things that you wanted to add. So really thinking about the what. This to me is good. Um, I don't know what if other members have suggestions or comments. This is like our statement or our, or our, um, our goal or our mission. Yes, or it was yep, your purpose statement. Yeah, all of the, OK. And um, this is Erin, and I know that I don't know if your next slide is how or if I know you guys are working through it, but um, just thinking about as we build the council, you know how, how members are invited or allowed to participate can be a real challenge. So just um, 
thinking ahead, but um, but just you know, certainly there will be particular groups I imagine that will be invited to the to the table. But um, how to allow other groups who want to be involved get involved is just again always can, can be a challenge. So, so then that brings that I wonder then if we need to have a criteria, like a, a criteria for um, eligible groups to be involved. Or, or who's who is eligible to be involved? Like, if we need to put a criteria together. Sure. Mr. Corns, can you advance two slides? I believe. Oh, actually, just one. This is one. So this was just. Um, can you go back one more? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm driving <laughs> crazy. <laughs> go forward one more. Okay. And we talked about this is this slide is really just revisiting um, the recommendation was for them to meet twice a year, twice a year, and you all wanted to meet four times a year. So mm -hmm. I just put that new recommendation in. Can you advance the slide one more time, Mr. Corns? Thank you. And then these are our preliminary recommendations around the structure of it. So to the criteria question, um, there are internal and as well as external um, stakeholders that could possibly be at the table and really trying to figure out who they are and how you all identify them will be some of the work, I guess, of the committee moving forward. Mm -hmm. But the recommendation, these is just, just the internal recommendations um, that we discussed. Can you go one more slide, Mr. Courts? Thank you. And then here's the external recommendations. So we think about voice and perspective. We definitely have our Baltimore County Area Education Advisory Councils, which we would have one member from each of those councils. And then other stakeholder groups, which we kind of discussed tonight. And then a local, um, the Baltimore County Diversity, Inclusion and Equity Community Advisory Council member. But again, these things are malleable and really up to the committee. Um, we just we thought that it would be a good representative sample because we talked a little bit about the the large size of the group. Even when we count these participants, it's a large group and even the conversation around subcommittees. Could you go one more slide, Mr. Corns? I think you got to click through. It might be animated. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> And I think this gets to like the the criteria question that might have been asked. Yeah, I was looking at that because that is a large group. So I like the subcommittee heights or subgroup idea. Um, And really thinking about and, and possibly what we can talk about the next time is the, the way that you all will, will arrange that subcommittee conversation. Mm -hmm. Would it be because um, now I'm thinking like the structure of it. Um, I guess it would be like maybe having a, a maybe one of the meetings would be the, the whole group do like just an initial group and then having subgroups out of that whole group. I don't know. I don't want to make it too complicated. Because um. if you think about four times, you could have two um, large convenings with everyone. So one in the fall and one in the spring. And then those two other meetings could be meetings of the subcommittees. And then the, those subcommittee reports, recommendations. And I know um, during our March meeting, you all um, made a point for those meetings to be held during um, budget impact times. Mm hmm. That would be good. Okay. And policy is best, you know, as best as you, as best as you know, um, with budget and policy, so that you really could utilize stakeholder perspective and input put as aligned with number three. Okay. All right. That looks good to me. Um, did anyone else have any questions? Or oh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to. It was at the end of the presentation. <laughs> That was the last um, item of new business. The next item is just planning for the next meeting. Got it. Oh, it looks like there's a comment from Ms. Mack. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the budget cycle, what, what, at what point are you talking about incorporating the feedback prior to Dr. Williams creating his proposed budget or once the board receives the proposed budget? Because it's two different things. That, it is. I was thinking prior to Dr. Williams um, oh. creating his proposed budget. So I agree. Can, I just wanted to make sure that that's the timeline that we were talking. Oh, OK. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions or comments? Okay. Okay, so then lastly, we have next steps, follow up agenda and um, some ideas or, or what I was thinking is um, based on uh, building off of what you showed us, the um, uh, equity lens and the side by side, I was thinking of using that and actually um, reviewing some policies um, to make sure that there's an equity lens or that we're being equitable in our policies. And uh, I just pulled up about four that I saw. Um, one was policy 0200, which was a uh, basic board commitment. Um, I, I, that, that hasn't been updated since 2016, so I was thinking about that one. Policy 4003, it was revised in 2020, but it's recruitment and selection. Just looking through it, making sure that we're looking at it equitably. Um, policy 4006, it was revised in 2016. Um, now this one, it may be um, a little bit different because it's medical evaluations, and I'm wondering if it needs to be updated or, or since COVID, looking at, a, um, at it through an equitable lens as far as um, health inequities. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure. And then also um, policy 4011, it was revised, looks like in 2015, a professional learning. Um, I didn't know what other um, members were thinking about that or, um, but just starting to look at, you know, maybe that we don't need to do all of them, maybe just one, but just looking at our policies, like we just looked at policy 0100 and looked at, you know, um, making improvements or, or, or adding to it. And um, so that was just one thing that I was thinking of for next steps for the agenda. And then also based on um, some of the things that I've heard and um, especially um, today, um, maybe if this committee would develop a anti, um, I don't know, maybe an inclusive, an inclusion resolution or something um, that we're inclusive and welcoming to all and um, anti-racist or, or I'm not sure how we would say it, but to have something that we would develop out of this committee and that we would uh, present to the full board and then maybe it's something that could be um, sent out to um, all of the schools. Um, so that's that's another idea. And then like a culturally sensitive statement at each school. Oh, Dr. Hager, you said you did that at, at the university. Yeah. Um, and then. My last. Miss Scott. Oh, oh, yes, I'm sorry. I was that's thinking okay. out loud. I just um, wanted to point out. On that comment. Oh. oh, OK. Yeah, what uh, really quick before I. Uh, OK, lose, uh, uh, yeah. OK, is that uh, to put in our um, policy uh, to maybe if we make a recommendation, I don't know if it would be an, a need to be a recommendation out of this committee to um, the PRC or to the full board that um, what Dr. Hager suggested to place in our equity um, policy 0100 about the inclusion of, of equity teams. So those are just two, some of the things I thought about. Yes, Ms. Pastor. OK, uh, going back to what you were saying prior to what you just said, resolutions, there was a period um, where schools did create and were to post um, their resolutions of inclusions and we put them in our main hallways so that as people came into the schools, they saw where we stood and it was tied to policy. I think that that is something we ought to look at. Uh, it just sort of died, but I think that that is something that we should look at going back to because then it's in everyone's face as he or she enters the building and moves through the building and it is attached to our policies. I think it goes to what Mr. Jairus says and making mm -hmm. things a little simpler uh, for them. Yeah, and I like that resolution of inclusion. That's a good, yeah. Good statement. So um, that's good. And then um, it looks like there's a comment from Ms. Mack. I was wondering, I, I know you're talking about policy, but I think we're also talking about agenda items. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, we're okay. on the no, no, I just want to make sure. Um, <laughs> would it be possible for us to have students speak to us as a committee? Um, to provide their insights on maybe being a student of color, a student who is 
um, who is experiencing homelessness, a student who is a gifted and talented student, a twice exceptional student. I, I don't know from the student, um, like protecting the students, um, personal information, if that's even allowed, but I, I would like to hear from students. I mean, I don't think any of us, it's been a very, very long time since I've been in, a, you know, been in school. And I'd like to know what it feels like to be a, a student. Um, you know, and maybe one of the students, Mr. Is it Jira talked about? Because um, he's in a predominantly white school system. I think he said he had 100 students of color. Maybe one of those students could talk to us about what it means to be one of 100 in a school of 1,000. Um, or, you know, one one of our students who is, you know, trying in, in spite of experiencing chronic homelessness or um, a student who qualifies for free and reduced meals, um, a student who wants to be, you know, more than he or she is as far as GT and then, of course, our twice exceptional. I mean, can we consider that and would that be too much of a logistical nightmare? What about our SMOB? No, we could definitely use our SMOB. Um, He's a Dundalk. I would love to hear from him. But I would like to hear from students, you know, from different perspectives and, and actually he probably meets a lot of the groups that I just talked about. Um, uh, obviously, he's gifted. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, obviously, he's a very gifted student. He's a student of color. Um, I don't know if he's a 2E student, um, and I don't know if he experienced homelessness, but it's just a thought that, you know, let's hear from our students. I think that's a good idea. Um, and. Um, I think uh, Dr. Logan Washington and others, I don't know, would there be any, um, as Ms. Mack was saying, um, any sort of logistical nightmare or any reason why that couldn't happen? If so, um, then maybe, you know, we could start with our small and then maybe he could mm -hmm. even recommend someone else, maybe from the student council or something. I, I don't know. Sure. Sure, yeah. I definitely think the SMOB would be a great, um, the outgoing as well as the incoming um, okay. to, to provide great perspective on what um, the things that they talk to their constituents, you know, some things that I do listen to them in my free time on Instagram <laughs> where they are, you know, are talking. So our students are brilliant and they have a pulse on what is happening to and through them in our school system. So I think that's a great idea. Dr. Hager also suggested in the chat that um, we do have a, a number of schools that have a DEI committee. So it could be something that um, we could reach out to the, the schools. I know um, definitely in the Catonsville area, there are schools that have DEI committees in, in schools that have them system wide to provide perspective. So it could be a possibility, but definitely our our SMOB and our our current SMOB and our um, incoming SMOB would be great perspective. I, I also just to to back up the committee idea, um, you know, that wouldn't put a child on the spot, you know, so if they could talk about the work that they're doing as a committee. Um, just thinking that might be a uh, an approach that wouldn't make an individual feel like they have to tell their story publicly, you know, um, and instead we could hear about the work they have been able to accomplish as a team. Again, if we're focusing on this team idea, so. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, we definitely don't want to put a, a child on the spot or, or make them um, share something they're, they're not comfortable with. So the reason why I thought of SMOBs is because they talk with their constituents and talk about their platforms and what they're doing and um, uh, we have such I, a I think the two SMOB idea to start with is a great idea. I didn't even think about that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea. That's good. Okay, I know we've given you all quite a bit <laughs> for for follow up, um, but I um, I think definitely out of the policies I had suggested, you know, maybe we just look at one at a meeting. I don't I don't want to take up the whole meeting doing policies, but just looking at it and getting us in the mindset of using the lens to try to review to see, you know, are our policies equitable? How are we applying them? And then also um, like um, Mrs. Pastor said, uh, developing a um, resolution of inclusion that we can develop 
um, in this committee and then present to the full board and then have it posted at all of the schools like right in the front. I think I think that's a, that's a great idea. Um, and then also Miss Max idea about um, bringing uh, the two smobs. So would that be too much for our next meeting? Um, one, two, three, four policy reviews. Um, Miss Logan. Well, no, no, not a... necessarily all of those. I was just oh, okay. Some. Yep. No, 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 no. Um, I think that's one, two, three agenda items. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to go past because I, I I appreciate yeah. the these ladies come from a, a long meeting prior to that and um. Uh, I think keeping us a, a, a smaller agenda, we're able to have more robust conversation. So I think we I don't want to cram too much. I Ms. think if Scott, we I would like to uh, I don't know where um, Mr. Mahomes is going to be in his journey of as a graduate and graduation and preparing for college. So we should probably look at the date and how that meshes with his schedule. OK, yeah, if um, Dr. Logan if, or, or if, if you know, would you all be able to reach out to him and let him know of the schedule and um, yeah. his availability? OK, absolutely. Thank you. So we'll, and I don't know kids still do senior week, but you know, maybe he, he might be on senior week or something. So that's all I'm saying. OK, yeah. Good point. Plus, I yeah, OK. So yeah, Dr. Logan Washington, that would be great. Absolutely, I'll reach out to our in, our incoming as well as our outgoings mop just to make sure that that is a date that they can um, provide us and I will update you as soon as I know. Thank you. OK, and then um, is it also the resolution of inclusion? Would it be possible to have that sent around to us before the meeting as well as the. Um, as as well as the um, which out of the policies I named like whichever one you choose just beforehand okay. so we could kind of look at it and um, uh, uh, compare it to the and also attach the equity lens so that we can compare it and then I think that'll help us have more of a robust discussion because we'll have had time to review it in advance. Sure, I will definitely discuss um, with Ms. Lagerman and um, Dr. Bosmo McComas to make sure you get everything that you need prior to. Great, okay, thank you. Um, all right, is there any other suggestions or questions? Because I appreciate um, everyone's time. OK, great. So if there um, if there is no further business, then our meeting is adjourned. So thank you all so much. And um, as always, it's, it's been a great meeting. So I hope everyone <laughs> has a great weekend. Thank, right, you. thank you. Bye, everyone.